I want to address these nominees since I'm the reason they were held over from last week. And I'll continue to hold over all department nominees, and I'll continue to insist on regular order in the floor until the Department of Justice stands up for the men and women of law enforcement. In the summer of 2020, left-wing street militias attacked the Portland Courthouse for weeks on end. U.S. Marshals defended that courthouse. They had to confront fireworks being shot at them, ball bearings being thrown at them, lasers being shot at their eyes, attempts to seal them in the courthouse and burn it to the ground. Now, left-wing activists are suing the deputy marshals who spent months on the front lines defending the courthouse. And the Department of Justice confirmed to me last night in a letter that they are not currently representing four of the U.S. Marshals who defended that. They gave no reason whatsoever. They've given no reason to those four deputy marshals either. Now, you may say that, well, they're under investigation or they did something wrong, but all four of those deputy U.S. Marshals are currently on unrestricted active duty. That means we're, we trust them to guard our courthouses and our judges, to go out in society and try to capture fugitives, to protect witnesses in the witness protection program, to guard dignitaries. Yet the Department of Justice refuses to pay for their legal fees or to provide them counsel in civil lawsuits against them for actions taken in the line of duty. I'd also point out this is happening right as we learn that the Department of Justice sought a greatly reduced sentence for Montez Lee, a career criminal who committed arson in the BLM riots in Minneapolis that resulted in the death of a father of five. The sentencing guidelines called for a 20-year sentence. The Department of Justice sought barely half of that, and in their sentencing document, they cited the fact that he was engaged in a social protest, giving voice to the voiceless, a man who burned alive a father of five. At a time that they are hanging out to dry, GS-11 and GS-13 police, exposing them to financial ruin and bankruptcy because they defended federal property in Portland. We all warned when the president nominated Vanita Gupta and this Senate confirmed her that the department would wage a war on the police, and that's exactly what they're doing right now. So until the department agrees to represent these four U.S. Marshals or they give a satisfactory answer for why they are not, then I will not allow any nominee to be fast-tracked through this committee or on the floor. I'd like to address that for a moment. I don't know much about this case that you noted. Uh, the death of Oscar Stewart was certainly tragic, and Montez Lee was appropriately prosecuted for the arson that led to his death. But before I discuss any circumstances of this case, let me be clear. The U.S. Attorney nominee, Andre Luger, had nothing, nothing to do with this. And yet he is the one who's being asked to pay a price, not just him, but the people who would be represented by his good offices. At a time when we're all giving speeches about law enforcement and our respect for police and law enforcement, you're showing your respect for law enforcement by telling me in the Northern District of Illinois, I have to wait on the appointment of U.S. Marshal. This is a professional lawman who has been given this position. No one has questioned his qualifications. You are not just punishing him, but you're really striking out at a situation in my state that desperately needs attention, and that is law enforcement to stop the gun violence and death. How can this be in honor of U.S. Marshals when you're holding up a U.S. Marshal? I would, Mr. Chairman, I'd point out that, as you said, this office has been vacant for almost three years since April 2018. So if it was such an urgent priority, you could have gone to Donald Trump in the summer oh, and yes. asked him and, to appoint and, a U.S. And, Marshal. Of course, President Trump just waited for my recommendations. Uh, I will tell you that they didn't consider it a priority. And that's a, that's a mistake that's not being made by this president. If you're going to make a speech about the violent crime and the death statistics that we're seeing across the United States, you cannot make that speech and hold up the U.S. Marshal that I need in the Northern District of Illinois to execute the duties of that office. It's long overdue. Don't punish my people I represent who are looking for law enforcement to the highest professional level by denying them a U.S. Marshal one day because of your concern about some other case in another state. That is not fair to my state, and it's not fair to this committee. The people, the people being punished are four 
career law enforcement officers. GS-11s and GS-13s have been hung out to dry by this department. Well, Why are they not being provided representation, as is the department's custom plead, and practice? Plead your case, but don't take it out on innocent people. Don't take it out on law enforcement. People who are innocent here are police who are facing the threat of financial And so ruin. you are holding up a U.S. Marshal for the Northern District of Illinois, my <laughs> law enforcement official that I need to protest the treatment of law, law officials, law enforcement officials in other states? How can that possibly be fair? Okay, Senator Durbin. Senator Klobuchar. Um, I, I've been discussing this with Senator Cotton. and I will continue to do that. And I just wanna make the case uh, for these two nominees uh, in Minnesota. Um, uh, number one, uh, Andy Luger, who you just mentioned, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, was not in the office uh, when this decision was made on the sentencing case, uh, but he was in the office uh, previously and has a respect of law enforcement across our state. Uh, he earned the respect of law enforcement, took on sex traffickers, major white collar offenders. He led a team of prosecutors, local police, and federal investigators uh, to put Jacob Wetterlings, one of the most notorious missing children cases in our country, to put his killer behind bars, a case that had looted law enforcement for decades. And in fact, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, when uh, President Trump came into office, I had extensive discussions with his counsel, Don McGahn. And I know uh, that Andy Luger, when they had uh, terminated the U.S. attorneys across the country, when one of only a few that they actually wanted to rehire. And these are direct discussions uh, with uh, me and Mr. McGahn because of Andy Luger's great respect. Andy Luger ended up not um, retaining that job, uh, but now he is willing to come back. Um, and he has been waiting uh, and had to stop his activities with his law firm because after he was got through this committee, uh, he was ready to go back and manage the office. And he believes that office needs managing and wants to get into the office. Um, and so holding him up serves no purpose at all uh, when it comes to issues that were raised in Minnesota. The second one is the one we're uh, considering today, Eddie Frizzell, 30 years of experience in law enforcement, uh, chief of police for Metro Transit in the Twin Cities, and also a 30-year veteran of the Minnesota Army National Guard, including two overseas deployments, one to Bosnia and another to Kuwait and Iraq. Uh, these are the two men uh, that are being held up in Minnesota at a time uh, where we need a leadership in place in our state. So I am hopeful we can work this out um, and we can put these two candidates, uh, both of whom are outstanding, uh, into these positions. Mr. Chairman, just 20 seconds, if I may. Senator Booker. Um, I, I know, and I, I talked to Senator Cotton on the floor yesterday. I'm going to do everything I can uh, to help. I just want to continue to state this because this is important to me, and maybe it's personal because Benita Gupta is a friend. But I just want to remind the committee for the record that uh, while some people had disagreed with her nomination, she had wide law enforcement support and continues. I just met with two law enforcement leaders one of which represents, their union represents, the majority of police officers of the United States of America, and they continue to believe in her and support her, and I know she is pro-law enforcement. Um, I will work with Senator Cotton to try to get um, an understanding of what the situation is, but I just feel the need to continue to let remind people that there were definitely objections to her nomination, but she had a tremendous bedrock of support from law enforcement agencies, organizations, and unions, and still maintains that support. Mr. Chairman. Senator Kennedy. Mr. Chairman, may I suggest that uh, at our next meeting you invite one of the senior officials from the Department of Justice to come before this committee to explain why the Department of Justice is not defending our U.S. Marshals? Well, Senator, uh, of course I want that question answered. Uh, asking for a hearing before the committee at this point may be premature. There has been a response, I believe. I think, Senator. Well, I'm well we know if we send a letter to the Department of Justice, we don't get responses, at least. No, Senator I think Congress he did. Doesn't. I think he's already received so, it. So I'll say I did get a response. Uh, after 10 days, as Senator Grassley said, it was mostly just a bunch of legal gobbledygook. It gave no answer on the merits about why one U.S. Marshal has already had his representation denied outright, while three are still being strung along. I, I can say that 
all the parties involved here have heard about the one is that it's not in the interest of the United States to provide representation. Let me say that I'm not going to take that as a satisfactory answer coming from Benita Gupta's civil division. Well, Matt, and, Matt. and I'll say se secondarily, the three who have been strung along, I mean, these incidents happened almost two years ago. It took Merrick Garland's Department of Justice barely three months to find that the officer who shot Ashley Babbitt on January 6 committed no wrongdoing. Why has it taken them almost two years to reach a conclusion in these marshals' cases after those marshals stood on the front lines were assaulted with lasers and ball bearings and fireworks and attacks by left-wing street militias? Well, if I could finish, Mr. Chairman, and I, and I, I'm, I don't mean to suggest that, that uh, Senator Cotton shouldn't have jumped in because I appreciate that answer, but a letter's one thing. Judging the credibility of a of live testimony is quite another. Let me, I would like to reassert my suggestion, Mr. Chairman, that at our next meeting, this is an urgent matter, uh, that we invite a, a senior representative to the Department of Justice to come explain to us, shouldn't take long, uh, why it is declined to represent our U.S. Marshals. I'd like to quote from the letter that was sent to Senator Cotton. I'm looking for the date on that letter. I think it's been within the last week or two. I don't yeah. see I don't see a date on the letter. It was yesterday. The Senator received a response yesterday. Let me read from it so that we understand what we're talking about here. The Department of Justice strongly supports the provision of representation for federal officers acting in the line of duty. The department has received numerous representation requests in connection with official law enforcement conduct relating to the Portland protest. We are providing direct representation or paying for private counsel for over 70 federal employees in response to these requests. To date, we have denied only a single request for representation arising from these events, and three requests remain under review. Now, that is not gobbledygook. That is a series of declarative sentences that I think make it clear. Three cases are being evaluated. One, they have denied. And for that, we're going to hold up the U.S. Marshal for the Northern Yeah, we are. District. We're going to hold up every department nominee. Well, I can, I can, yeah, ju we are. I can just I don't tell care. you. I, don't I'm glad they're representing the 70. I care about the four. Don't give a speech about law enforcement in Northern District and any, any violent crime if you're holding up the law enforcement officials that are going to be given the responsibility of taking care of that issue. I could share your concerns about wanting to know what they're going to do with the three and why the one was denied. That is a legitimate concern. But to take it out on law enforcement in Illinois... For goodness sakes, or other states, Minnesota, does that show respect for law enforcement? Mr. Chairman? Senator Kennedy. Not to put too fine a point on it, but may I suggest that we invite the author of that letter to come to our next Judiciary Committee meeting and explain this situation? The author is Peter Hyen, Acting Assistant Attorney General. I do not know him. I think it is appropriate to ask that he or someone he represents uh, come before us. I don't think it has to be a formal committee meeting. Let's find out where we stand on the, the four that Senator Cotton has a question on. Well, I was, I would, look, you can, you, you're the chairman. You can, you can decline my request, but this concerns me, and I, I'm, I just found out that one of those U.S. Marshals may be in Louisiana, and uh, I think it would, would behoove all of us to hear together so we could all ask questions from uh, the gentleman whose name I've already forgotten, but- Mr. Hine. Mr. Hine. Uh, Justice is right across the street. Just ask him to come on over and let's hear directly. So, so I would say that, that Peter Hine is not the right person here. He's merely the acting assistant attorney okay. general for legislative affairs. He's just transmitting a substantive decision that's been made, presumably by Vanita Gupta as the associate attorney general since he oversees the civil division, which represents law enforcement officers in the for lawsuits in the line of duty. Again, th these officers have been hung out to dry. They have no reason. They've been the one who's been denied has been given no factual reason why he was denied representation. Well, Merely that ask, it was in the interest of the United States. Who asked Ms. I, I'm, I, I'm not I'd wedded. Love, I'd love to I, ask her. I don't know who the appropriate person is. So let me amend my suggestion to bring the appropriate person to our next Judiciary Committee meeting to answer these questions. 
Right. I'm going to pursue this uh, matter. We don't know the circumstances. We don't know if we're dealing with privacy issues, uh, attorney-client privilege issues. We just don't know. We have one who's been denied. Maybe we can learn that, uh, the facts behind that. Maybe we can't. You know as an attorney there are certain things that just can't, maybe wouldn't be disclosed to the public related to personnel matters and the like. So I don't want to have an open hearing people under oath until we've at least taken another step of asking for follow-up on this letter. Three are under review. Perhaps they'll be decided well, soon. And, and I understand, Mr. Chairman. Um, may, may I suggest that you attempt to get that answer from the Department of Justice, and if they don't answer within 10 days, I would reassert my suggestion that we ask Ms. Gupta to come on over and tell us what's going on. I don't know if she's the appropriate person. Uh, or the appropriate person. And I would say we don't, we don't know the circumstances. These four marshals don't know the circumstances either. Here's what we do know. All four of them, all four are on unrestricted active duty with the marshal service. Now there are cases in which the Department of Justice can legitimately decline representation if a law enforcement officer committed a serious felony in violation of clearly established law at the time, that may be appropriate. But how could they possibly be denying representation to these four marshals and then sending them back out on unrestricted active duty? Well, I'm suggesting, Tom, is that this, can be, this matter can be cleared up pretty quickly. I'm willing to start the meeting at 8 o'clock, whatever time you want to start it. Um, let's bring the appropriate person over from the Department of Justice and respectfully ask them what's going on here. Why aren't you uh, representing these marshals? And if they say attorney client privilege, whatever, we'll learn something. I might also add that that letter made it clear that they, they would represent them for acting in the line of duty, which may be the issue. I don't know, but I will pursue it to get uh, clarification from this letter and we'll decide after that effort is made whether there's anything more that needs to be made. But I think that's the first reasonable request is that they give us more information than contained in the letter that was received yesterday. Just, I would just ask, Mr. Mr. Chairman, that we, we don't allow them to rope-a-dope us. They, they give us an answer, and if they don't give us an answer, we think about bringing them over. I respect that, and I'm willing to live by that standard. But to think that innocent individuals are having their appointments held up in this committee to execute the responsibility of law enforcement at a time of high crime in my state is an unacceptable pressure point. I just think it is, doesn't make sense. It's inconsistent to argue how much we revere law enforcement by holding up law enforcement officials that this administration wants to appoint.